from around the globe. It's theCUBE, with coverage of KubeCon and CloudNativeCon Europe 2020, virtual. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and ecosystem partners. Hi, I'm Stu Miniman and welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of KubeCon CloudNativeCon Europe for 2020. Get to talk to the participants in this great community and ecosystem where they are around the globe. And when you think back to the early days of containers, uh, it was, uh, can, you know, containers, uh, that they're lightweight, they're small, uh, going to obliterate virtualization is often the, the, the headline that we had. Of course, we know everything in IT tends to be additive, and here we are in 2020, and containers and virtual machines uh, living side by side, and often we'll, we'll see the back and forth. Uh, that, that happens uh, when we talk about virtualization and containers. To talk about that uh, topic specifically, happy to welcome to the program, first time guest, Steve Gordon. He's the Director of Product Management at Red Hat. Steve, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Stu. It's great to be on. All right, as I, as I teed up, of course, uh, you know, virtualization was a wave that swept through uh, the, the data center. Uh, it is you know, a, a major piece, not only of what's in the data center, but even if you look at, at, at the public clouds, often it was virtualization underneath there. Uh, certain companies like Google, of course, you know, really drove a container adoption. And you know, often you hear when people talk about, you know, I, I build something cloud native, uh, that underlying piece of being containerized uh, and then using an orchestration layer like Kubernetes is, is what they talk about. So maybe start for a sec, you know, Red Hat, of course, heavily involved in, in virtualization. Uh, and containers, how you see that, that landscape and you know, what, what's the general conversation you have with customers as to how they make, make the choice and, and how, how those, the, the lines blur between those worlds? Yep, so uh, at Red Hat, I think we've been working on uh, certainly the current iteration of uh, Linux virtualization with KVM for uh, around 12 years and myself uh, a large, large portion of that. And I think you know, one thing that's always been constant is while from the outside in, virtualization looks like it's been a fairly you know, stable uh, marketplace, it's always changing, it's always evolving. And what, what we're seeing right now is as people are adopting uh, containers and even constructs built on top of containers into their workflows, uh, there is more interest and more desire around how can I combine these things, recognizing that still an enormous percentage of my workloads are out there running in virtual machines today. Um, but I'm building new things around them that need to be able to interact with them and kind of springboard off of that. Um, so I think, you know, over the last couple of years, um, I'm sure you yourself have seen a number of different projects uh, pop up in the open source community around this kind of intersection of containers and virtualization and how can these te technologies complement each other. Uh, and, you know, certainly uh, Kubevert is one of the projects that we've started in this space uh, in reaction to both that general interest, but also the real customer problems that people have uh, as they try and meld these two worlds. Right, so Steve, at, at Red Hat Summit uh, earlier this year, there was a lot of talk around container native virtualization. If you could just uh, explain what that means, how that might be different from uh, just, just virtualization in general, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. Sure. Uh, so back in, I think, early 2017, late 2016, we started kind of playing around with this idea. We'd already seen the momentum around Kubernetes and a result kind of the way we architected OpenShift uh, 3 at the time uh, ar around how Kubernetes has this strength as an orchestration platform, but also a shared provider of uh, storage, networking, et cetera, resources. And really thinking about, you know, when we look at virtualization and containers, some of these problems are very common regardless of what footprint the workload happens to fit into. Uh, so leveraging uh, that strength of Kubernetes as an orchestration platform, we started looking at what would it look like to orchestrate virtual machines on that same platform right next to our application containers. Uh, and kind of the extension of that, the Kubevert project and what has ultimately become OpenShift virtualization is based around that core idea of how can I make a virtual machine, a traditional virtual machine, so a full operating system, uh, interact with and look exactly like a Kubernetes native construct um, that I can use from the same platform. Uh, I can manage it using the same constructs. I can interact with it using the same console, uh, all of these kind of ideas. And then, you know, on top of that, um, not just bring in workloads kind of as they lie, but enable really powerful workflows for people who are building a, a new application in containers that still needs some um, backend components, say a database that's sitting in a VM, uh, 
uh, or also you know trying to integrate those virtual machines into new constructs, whether it's something like a pipeline or a service mesh. We're hearing a lot of questions around those things these days, where people don't want to just apply those things to brand new workloads, but figure out how do they apply those constructs to the broader uh, majority of their fleet of workloads that exist today. All right, so uh, I, I believe back at Red Hat Summit, OpenShift virtualization was in beta. Where, where, where's the product and solution set sit today? Right, so at uh, this year's KubeCon, we're happy to announce that OpenShift virtualization uh, is moving to general availability. Uh, so it will be a fully supported part of uh, OpenShift. Uh, and what that means is you, know, you as a subscriber to OpenShift, the platform, get virtualization as just an additional capability of that platform uh, that you can enable as an operator from the operator hub, um, which is really a powerful thing for admins to be able to do that. Uh, but also is just really powerful in terms of the user experience. Like once that operator is enabled on your cluster, uh, the little tab shows up that shows that you can now go and create a virtual machine. Um, but you also still get all of the, the metrics and the shared networking and so on that goes with that cluster um, that underlies it all. Uh, and you can, again, do some really powerful things in terms of combining those constructs for both virtual machines and uh, containers. Yeah, when, when you talk about that line between virtualization and containers, a big question is, what does this mean for developers? How is it different from uh, what, what they were uh, using before? How, how do they engage and interact uh, with their infrastructure today? Sure, so I think you know, the way um, a lot of this current wave of technology got started for people was, um, whether it was with Kubernetes or Docker before that, um, you know, people would go and grab, um, the easiest way they could grab compute capacity was go to their virtual machine farm, uh, whether that was uh, their local virtualization estate at their company, or whether that was taking a credit card to public cloud, um, getting a virtual machine and spinning up uh, a container platform on top of that. Uh, what we're now seeing is as that's transitioning into people building their workloads um, almost entirely around these container constructs, in some case when they're starting from scratch, um, there is more interest in how do I leverage that platform directly? Um, how do I, as my application group, have more control over that platform? Um, and in some cases, depending on the use case, like if they have uh, demand for uh, GPUs, for example, or other high-performance devices, you know, that question of whether the virtualization layer between my physical host and my container is adding that much value, um, but then still wanting to bring in the traditional workloads that I have as well. Um, so I think we've seen this gradual transition where there is a growing interest in reevaluating, like how do we start with containers, container-based architectures to kind of, okay, how as we transition towards more production scenarios and the growth in production scenarios, like what tweaks do we make that, to that architecture? Does it still make sense to run all of that on top of virtual machines or does it make more sense to almost flip that equation as my workload mix gradually starts changing? Yeah, I, two, two, two thoughts come to mind on that. Number one is, you know, are there specific applications out there or I think about traditionally VMs Often that's Windows environments that 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 we have there. Is is that some of the the use case to bring them over to containers? Um, and then also once I've gotten it into the container environment, what are the steps to move forward? Because I uh, have to expect that there's going to be some some refactoring, some modernization to take advantage uh, of the the innovation and pace of change, not just to take it, containerize it, and leave it. Yeah, so certainly there is an enormous amount of potential out there in terms of Windows workloads. Um, and people are definitely trying to work out how do they uh, leverage those workloads in the context of OpenShift and a Kubernetes-based environment. Um, and Windows containers, obviously, is one way to address that. And certainly, um, that is very powerful in and of itself uh, for bringing those workloads to uh, OpenShift and Kubernetes, but does have some constraints in terms of needing to be on a relatively uh, recent version of Windows Server and so on for those workloads to run in that um, construct. So where OpenShift virtualization helps with that is we can actually take an existing virtual machine workload, bring that across, uh, even if it's say Windows Server uh, 2012, run it on top of the OpenShift virtualization platform as a VM, uh, and then if or when you, you start modernizing more of that application, um, you can start teasing that out into actual containers. And that's actually something, you know, it was one of our very early uh, demos at Red Hat Summit 2018, I think, was kind of how you would go about doing that. Uh, and, and primarily we did that because it is a very powerful thing for customers to see how they can bring those uh, old applications 
uh, into this this mix. Um, and the other aspect of that I'll mention is, you know, one of our uh, financial services customers who we've been working with basically since that demo, they saw it from a hallway at Red Hat Summit and came and said, "Hey, we want to talk to you guys about that." You know, one of their uh, primary workloads is a Windows 10 um, style environment um, that they happen to be bringing in as well, uh, and that's more in that construct of t treating OpenShift almost as a pool of compute, which you can use for many different workload types, uh, with the Windows 10 being just one aspect of that. Um, and the other thing I'll say in terms of you know the second part of the question, uh, what do I need to do in terms of refactoring? So we are very conscious of the fact that you know for this to provide value, you have to be able to bring in uh, existing virtual machines as, as with as minimal change as possible. So we do have a migration solution set um, that we've had for a number of years uh, for bringing uh, virtual machines to Linux virtualization stacks. Uh, we're expanding that to include OpenShift virtualization as a target. Uh, to help you bring in those existing virtual machine images. Uh, where things do change a little bit uh, is in terms of the operational uh, approaches. Obviously, the admin console now is OpenShift uh, for those virtual machines. Um, that does right now um, present a change, uh, but we think it is a very powerful opportunity in terms of as people get more and more production workloads into containers, for example, it's going to become a lot more appealing to have a backup solution, for example, that can cater to both the virtual machine workloads as well as any stateful container workloads you may have, um, which do exist in increasing numbers. Well, I, I'm glad you brought up a uh, stateful uh, discussion because, you know, as an industry, we spent a long time uh, making sure that virtual machines uh, have storage and have networking that is reliable and performant and, and the like. Uh, what what, what are, should, are, should customers be thinking about and operators when they move to containers? Are there things that are different uh, you manage bringing it into? Uh, this brings them into the OpenShift management plane. So what, what else should I be thinking about? What do I need to do differently uh, when, when, I've, when I've embraced this? Yeah, so I think, in terms of the things that a virtual machine expects, um, you know, the, the two big ones that come to mind to me um, are networking and storage. Um, the compute piece is still there, obviously, but I think it's a little less complicated to solve just because um, the OpenShift and broader Kubernetes community have done such a great job of addressing that piece, and that's really what attracted us to it in the first place. Uh, but on the networking side, um, certainly the, the expectation, expectations of a traditional virtual machine are a little bit different to um, the networking model of Kubernetes by default. Um, but again, we've seen a lot of growth in container-based applications, uh, particularly in the context of cloud-native network functions that have been pushing the boundaries of Kubernetes networking as well. Um, that's resulted in projects like Maltus, uh, which allow us to give a virtual machine the layer two networking interface that it expects, um, but also give it the option of using the pod networking natively. Um, for some of those more powerful constructs um, that are native to Kubernetes. So that's that's one of those areas where you've kind of got a, a mix of options depending on how far you want to go from a modernization perspective versus do I just want to bring this workload in and run it kind of as it is and my modernization is more built around it uh, in terms of other container-based things. Um, then similarly in storage, uh, it's an area where obviously uh, at Red Hat, we've been working closely with the OpenShift Container Storage team, but we also uh, work with a number of ecosystem partners on not just how do we uh, certify their storage plugins and make sure they work well both for containers and virtual machines, uh, but also how do we push forward upstream efforts uh, around things like the container storage interface specification um, to allow for these more powerful capabilities like snapshots, cloning, and so on, uh, which we need for virtual machines, but are also very valuable for container-based workloads as well. Steve, you've, you've mentioned uh, some of the reasons why customers were moving uh, t towards this environment. Uh, now that you're GA, uh, what, what learnings did you have during beta? Are there any other customer stories you could share uh, that, that you've learned along this journey? Yeah, so I think one of the things I'll say is that uh, you know, there's no feedback like direct um, product in the hands of customer feedback. And it's really been interesting to see the different ways that people have applied it. Um, not necessarily having set out to apply it, but having got, gotten partway through their journey and realized, hey, I need this capability. Um, you have something there that looks pretty handy and then you know, having success with it. So uh, in particular, um, in the telecommunications vertical, we've been working closely uh, with a number of providers around um, their 5G rollouts and their 5G core in particular, uh, where they've been focused on uh, cloud native network functions. And really what I mean by that is the 
wave of technology and the push they're making around 5G is to take what they started with network function virtualization a step further and build that next generation network around cloud native technologies, including uh, Kubernetes and OpenShift. And as they've been doing that, they have been finding that some of their vendors are more or less prepared um, for that transition. Uh, and that's where, uh, while they've been able to leverage uh, the power of containers for those applications that are ready, they're also able to leverage OpenShift virtualization as a transitionary step as they modernize the pieces that are taking a little bit longer. And that's where uh, we've been able to run um, some applications in terms of the load balancer, in terms of a um, carrier grade database on top of OpenShift virtualization, which we probably wouldn't have set out to do this early in terms of our plan, um, but we were really able to react quickly to that customer demand and help them um, get that across the line. And I think that's a really powerful example where, you know, the end state may not necessarily be to run everything as a virtual machine forever, uh, but they're still able to leverage the technology as a powerful tool in the context of a broad and broader modernization effort. All right. Well, Steve, thank you so much for giving us the updates. Congratulations on going GA for this solution. Definitely look forward to hearing more from the customers uh, as, as, they, as they come. All right. Thanks for having me on, Steve. Appreciate it. All right. And stay tuned for more coverage of KubeCon, Cloud Native Con, EU 2020, the virtual edition. I'm Stu Miniman, and thank you for watching The Cube.